Hello, my name is Ramon Molto. I am professor at Universitat Politecnica de Valencia in Spain. And as a member of the AI Spring project, I'm going to talk in this video about serverless computing. Now, cloud services and applications in general require managing both data and computing. And data is typically in the form of files, databases, memory values, while computing are the resources and the execution environments required to process that data. And if you want to achieve high availability and fault tolerance, then you need to manage both replication and distribution of that data and computing. Replication means several components doing the same thing, while distribution is the potential um, separation of these components in a geographically distributed manner. So both replication and distribution are key elements for fault tolerance. Now, if we focus on the data management, that is being done in Amazon S3, we see that it is very simple in which you just create a bucket, you upload a file into a bucket, and AWS is responsible for capacity planning, storage provisioning, long-term durability, fault tolerance, all achieving both replication and distribution among the several availability zones within the same region. So if we focus on how storage is managed, but then how computing is managed, then isn't it possible to abstract the infrastructure further so that we can run an application on top of the cloud without really needing to know the details of the underlying virtual infrastructure? I mean, Amazon S3 does this for storage. Cannot we have something similar for computing? Then we enter AWS Lambda. And this is a service that allows to run functions in response to events so that scaling is done automatically. These are stateless functions. Stateless means that they have no affinity with the underlying execution infrastructure. They're executing in micro virtual machines with a maximum direction of 15 minutes. And you can define several sources of events so that when you invoke a REST API, it triggers the execution of a Lambda function. So when you upload a file, it triggers the execution of a Lambda function. And the advantage is that you don't need uh, to, to, to mess around with the typical uh, AWS uh, resources required to deploy highly scalable uh, cloud services, such as elastic load balancers, auto-scaling, easy to instance. But the disadvantage is that it requires redesigning the application. But it, is, it has a very fine grain uh, paper usage in blocks of one millisecond. So when the uh, Lambda function is not being invoked, invoked, then there is no cost associated to having the function, let's say, um, pre-provision ready to be invoked in the cloud. Now, Lambda uses uh, micro virtual machines uh, with, um, and there are some Amazon machine images pre-configured for this environment. So it facilitates the development of, of uh, applications before uh, running them on AWS Lambda. Uh, it allowed 3,000 concurrent executions, uh, up to 10 gigs of RAM, up to 10 gigs of uh, persistent, non-persistent uh, scratch space in slash TMP, and 15 minutes maximum runtime. So if your application fits within this execution um, constraints, um, then you can benefit from, from the highly scalable a capacities of AWS Lambda because these 3,000 concurrent executions are orders of magnitude beyond the number of virtual machines that you can deploy in a, in a um, AWS account with the soft limits, which are initially defined. Now, there are several event sources that you can define for your function, CloudWatch Events, which now it's called Event Bridge, Amazon S3, DynamoDB, for for um, no no SQL tables uh, kinesis for uh, streamings streams of flows of data API gateway for REST API so whenever one of these uh, events is triggered then your execution and uh, lambda function is executed then you can have a moni um, monitoring integrated at the level of the lambda function so you can see uh, how many times it was invoked. Uh, the duration of, of each invocation to see if you are um, under the service level objective defined for your application. Typically, for example, an HTTP request needs to be resolved uh, below 300 uh, milliseconds.
there are two execution types. You have the request response, in which you can do a synchronous invocation of a Lambda function, but then you can have an asynchronous invocation. So this is used for event processing. And it's very interesting because if you exceed the maximum number of concurrent invocations and you are doing synchronous invocation, this, of course, is this gives a, um, an HTTP error code. But the good stuff comes here. And if you're performing asynchronous invocations, so Lambda automatically retries the event for up to six hours. That means that if you upload, for example, a million images into an Amazon S3 bucket, which is connected to a single AWS Lambda function, then the Lambda function will be executing these 3,000 concurrent invocations, but Lambda will automatically process the, the rest of the events. Uh, so eventually these 1 million images will be processed and without your um, dedicating time to monitoring the execution, babysitting the execution, uh, retrying for errors and things like that. So this is a very powerful um, primitive. So uh, cloud, um, the output of the Lambda functions are stored in CloudWatch logs. It allows to centralize, store, and search the Lambda function for log entries. You can also have a stateful Lambda functions. You can connect an Amazon EFS, which provides the, the NFS as a service, network file system as a service. So, so for distributed training of AI applications, it's very interesting. You, you can have the data set in an a EFS endpoint, and this EFS endpoint is connected to uh, to a Lambda function so that the several invocations of the Lambda function will have access to the same scalable shared file system. So you can have the serverless supercomputing with these primitives. If you're more interested in the underlying details of a Lambda function, uh, I would suggest to take a look at the Firecracker micro VM technology under the hood, and also this article, Peeking Behind the Guardians of Serverless Platforms and the security overview of AWS Lambda if you are more interested in, in security. Now, Lambda functions represent the model of functions as a service. Now, we focus on serverless applications. Serverless applications are those that are using managed services in which the elasticity is entirely managed by the service provider. And the user or the developer does not focus on provisioning resources and configuring resources. It's focusing on business logic. S3 is um, it's a serverless service, Lambda is a serverless service, DynamoDB is a serverless service, and all of these services are managed, the scalability are managed by the um, uh, provider. Now, if you want to expose a Lambda function into the internet, then you need to use an API to invoke the function remotely, and you need to solve issues such as access authorization or increases in invocation traffic. And even if Lambda, AWS Lambda provides an ability to expose an HTTP endpoint, if you want to go one step beyond in terms of functionality, then API Gateway is the way to go. It allows to create, publish, maintain um, REST APIs. It can protect against distributed denial of services. And it can also be integrated using Cognito for authentication and authorization. Uh, even if it has some weird limits, 29 seconds maximum invocation time, and if you combine um, uh, Lambda and API Gateway with some persistent um, um, database, for example, a DynamoDB table, then you can have these serverless architecture examples in which you can have a web application to obtain weather information, which is a story in DynamoDB, and it offers a REST API, which is created with API Gateway. So the Lambda function is executed whenever an API um, get request is issued into API Gateway. And the Lambda function queries the DynamoDB in order to fetch the data and produce, let's say, a JSON or a jumble file and send it back through the API Gateway in through the client, which, by the way, can run a uh, um, front-end application and do some Vue.js, React, um, a, a processing in the front end in order to use, for example, a graphical library in order to create some statistics or, or, or some um, histograms, for example, depending on the application. Now, if we take a look at this web application architecture, we see here that we have the S3 um, and CloudFront, which provides a content delivery network in order to host in the front end of the application. Route 53 is a 
um, domain name service service, and the back end of the application is the API, API, API gateway Lambda and DynamoDB integrated with Cognito for uh, authentication and authorization. But Lambda functions um, are, are, are a bit pricey. They are very scalable, they are very convenient, but if you are facing a service in which you have a high service usage, it may be interesting to use a traditional virtual machine-based architecture in order to reduce the, the, the costs. So if you are facing, let's say, um, an application that requires providing um, hardware resources, then this might be your your technology, especially for creating cloud services, which might be invoked every every now and then, or have a um, highly um, variable execution uh, patterns. Now, thank you very much for your attention.